Hello and welcome to the Overland Journal podcast. I'm your host, Scott Brady, and I'm here with my co-host, Matt Swartz. Hello. And we are going to go through kind of a technical subject today because we want to talk about ground tents. And the reason why we want to talk about ground tents is that people don't tend to talk about ground tents, but they're actually not only the most common tent used for overland travel, but they're also one of the most useful. So we're going to go through the reasons why they're great and the reasons why they may be a little bit of a compromise. And then we're also going to feature quite a few tents that that Matt recently tested for an upcoming Overland Journal article on ground tents. What issue is that going to go into? I believe that's going to be summer 22. Okay, yep. nice. We'll put some parameters around the tents that Matt tested. Talk about what was the considerations around the units that you chose. Picking ground tents, you know, there's so many on the market. So we obviously had to narrow it down a little bit. I've made an effort to adhere to kind of our traditional best of breed format, which is not picking a bunch of things that are the same. It's picking a bunch of things that are specifically different from one another. Um, but kind of the unifying thing that I looked for were were tents that could easily fit inside a vehicle. So we're talking like an SUV or even something smaller like a Jeep. The six tents that we tested, they could all fit inside a smaller vehicle fairly easily. So we are going to talk about the other tents in this segment as well. So we'll talk about an Oz tent. We'll talk about a Gazelle tent and others, but those are a lot longer units. Matt's test was very specific around bag tents that fit inside a compact SUV in the back of a compact SUV. But we are going to talk through about 10 different units today. The first thing is, let's dig into why do we want to use a ground tent, Matt? Like, what's the reason to even consider it with how popular roof tents are? I was going to say, are we even overlanding if we're not in a rooftop <laughs> tent? I mean, yeah, you know, there's, exactly. there's a lot of emphasis on them. No, yeah. um, ground tents are awesome for a variety of reasons. Uh, they also have some downsides. But, you know, to start off with some of the pros, I think one of the things that I recognize the most is the fact that it is in fact separate from the vehicle. I do think that that is a benefit of the ground tent. And the best way I can illustrate that point to you is when you want to go out for an adventure for the day and camp is set up. If you're based out of your truck, if you're sleeping in a rooftop tent or even in the bed of your truck, you have to put everything away to go and hit the trail. And that's going to eat up time. And, you know, for those of us who maybe only have the weekends to get after it, we don't want to waste time with stuff like that. Being able to set up your ground tent at your base camp and leave it set up for the duration of your stay is awesome. You know, you get yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. You get up, you get in your truck, you go hit the trail and you don't really have to put things away. Yeah. So you could go do a, a day trip of four wheel driving, or you could go see that ancient ruin, or you could go fishing in your favorite fishing hole. And then you come back and the tent's ready to go. And you're not needing to break down a roof tent, for example, or fold up a, some kind of a, a built-in expedition camper system. So exactly. I mean, I, I think about like vans as, as mobile adventure rigs too, right? Like for the sure. van is, or RV is the ultimate example of everything has to be put away before you can drive. And you so, pay the consequences yeah, if you don't. Yeah. I've learned that. So yeah, that would be my first pro that I would I would look at. What about you? Yeah, that's you a, think? that's a good one. And one of the things that I really like about ground tents is they're just typically, they are much less of an investment than a lot of other forms of sleeping. So if you go with a, like a habitat system that can be many thousands of dollars, if you go with a roof tent, particularly a hard shell, that can be three, four or $5,000. Uh, there's even some now that are pushing the $20,000 range, which they absolutely have their place. When you're first getting involved with travel, I mean, we've talked about this a lot on the podcast is we should be spending the last amount of money that we have on the gear, not the first. It should be all of the money that we spend should be on fuel and plane tickets and food and the ability to go someplace remote or unique. So I think really focusing on the travel first and the gear second oftentimes means that we make compromises around the gear that we use. And that's why I really like the fact that ground tents are inexpensive. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, it's just, it's nice when you don't have a, you know, a barrier to entry and the ground tent sidesteps that, right? Like, And you can easily find them a good quality ground tent in the two, three, four hundred dollar range easily. You can even find them less than that. Um, and of course you can find like highly specialized ground tents. Like I think about the Arctica oven that we used in Antarctica that, you know, was many thousands of dollars, but it's so specialized that you just don't typically buy a tent like that for general overland travel. I totally agree. Yeah. I think in our, in, in the test that I did for OJ, uh, we had a range, anything from, I think the least expensive tent we had was in the two to $300 range, but I definitely tested some premium ground tents too that were 
up approaching the two thousand yeah. dollar uh, range with all of the accessories that were included. So it's oftentimes that we think that they're not as durable, but there are ground tents that are made that are very very durable. What do you got next on your list? One of the other really uh, big benefits of ground tents is that they can be very specialized for environments, and you kind of just mentioned that a minute ago, the, the tent that's used in the Arctic environment. Ground tents have been made for expeditions, right? And expeditions go to all different parts of the world. You know, mm-hmm. some go to jungles, some go to Arctic regions, some go to mountains. And really, you want to select an appropriate ground tent for where you're going. That's great for the overland traveler because you can tailor your ground tent to where you intend to go. Mm. Um, you know, like if you're going to go to Greenland or someplace where there's going to be wind and snow, maybe you want a tunnel that's super strong that's going to hold up in the wind. Sure. Or maybe Maybe you're going somewhere where you want heavy duty, thick material that's going to keep you warm in a cold environment where wind is not an issue. Or maybe you want something super lightweight for like a desert environment that's just going to let the breeze blow right through and keep you nice and cool. There's a lot of specialization. Well, and that leads to a question that a lot of people will ask is, do you get a three season or a four season tent? I think it's oftentimes a mistake to buy a four season tent if you don't need it. So maybe share a little bit with the listener about the differences between a three season and a four season tent. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So for the vast majority of us, I think three season tents, you you kind of hit the nail on the head. A three season tent is totally sufficient. The only time where you really need a four season tent is if you're going to be experiencing um, like gale force winds or heavy snow loads. That's going to help you save a lot of money in the long run if you don't invest, because usually that's the biggest price jump is from the three season to the four season tent. Yeah. Just in terms of how we're going to use them, let's be realistic. You know, most of us are not going to want to go out in a blizzard to go camping. We're just not going to do it. Save yourself some money and save the weight too. You know, four season tents are going to be heavier. Mm -hmm. Uh, Setup is usually more complex. Correct. Um, A lot of times they have external and internal poles. They're oftentimes single wall, heavy duty, single wall. The biggest compromise that you get with a four season is a reduced ventilation in almost all cases. Now there are exceptions to every rule when it comes to ground tents. There are highly specialized four season ground tents that do have good ventilation. But for the most part, because they're designed for extreme snow and cold and high wind, they have a smaller ventilation footprint. I would agree. Yeah. I I think back to one of the first four season tents I owned and it was like a little two person. It was like a one plus person mountaineering tent. Sure. And it was actually a single wall tent that was made out of like a Gore-Tex membrane. So it's supposed to be a waterproof, breathable membrane. Interesting. Every time I used it in a cold environment, all of the condensation on the inside would freeze to the inner layer. And if you tap the walls, you get this like (laughs) raining of ice crystals down. It's brutal. Yeah. I mean, it it keeps you alive and it does its job, but a little bit, you know, specialized. So yeah. So it's important to buy the right tent for your application and buying a three season tent. And there are like, they call them three season plus. They've got some different configurations on the fly that can get you a lot better coverage. And if you get a small snowstorm or something like that, that comes through. So make sure you buy the right tent for the conditions that you're going to travel in. I was going to say, I think when it really comes down to it, I think snow load is the final kind of thing. There are a lot of three season tents that are in fact, pretty solid in strong winds, especially if you guy them out completely. But snow load is a different story. You know, if you get 40 pounds of snow on a lightweight aluminum pole, it's not designed in a way to to be, you know, some of, some of those four season tents, they have every time the poles cross, they add a lot more stability. And so mm. some of the three season tents just don't have that. So they'll do all right in the wind, but then yeah, dump 40 pounds of snow on them and you might have a broken pole or something. Yeah, it was unbelievable. We were heading to the South Pole and we needed to get to this fuel stop and it was basically a fuel drop. So they just basically shove the fuel barrels out of the back of a plane. Like, either do f- they even shut down the plane? They, they keep don't. It running, they right? just, they don't even land. Oh, <laughs> cause it's too far for them to land and take off again Got with it. the fuel that they have. So they basically just dump the fuel out of the back of the plane. Wow. Um, and sometimes they'll dump it on us with a a skid with a parachute. That's the most typical one. So then you kind of have a general GPS point and then you got to go find it and the parachutes help you find it. And then they usually have long poles on the skid. So that way you can see the poles sticking up through the snow. And we, we get to this point and I see this bright yellow patch of fabric and I figure it's a, you know, it's got to be one of those, one of those parachutes. And I get over there and I start digging and it's actually a North face dome tent. Like they're heavy, extreme expedition tent. Yeah. And it was still upright. It had actually, the snow had gathered all the way around it. You could tap on the material and it, there was no snow on the inside. It was still intact. Wow. Unbelievable. And the snow was seven or eight feet high, you know, cause it had covered up almost all of the tent. And we were asking one of the locals, like, how is that even possible? They said, that thing has been there as long as we've been coming here. Now it's got the advantage of has a snow structure around it. Unbelievable how yeah. strong those tents are. That's incredible. Yeah. Really cool. One of the things that 
that I really like about ground tents is the reduction in weight. It's something that we're always mindful of when we travel. Vehicles perform better when they're lighter. They stop better when they're lighter. They do better in sand and mud and snow uh, when they don't have so much payload. So we harp on payload a lot. And one of the easy ways to reduce the weight of something is with the ground tent, as opposed to a, a heavy tent affixed to the top of the vehicle with all of the rack systems or the crossbars that are required to support it. So if you've got a vehicle with a low payload, um, like we were just testing a 392 Wrangler and it had an 850 pound payload. Wow. So you take two adults and you're just about halfway there. Yeah. And then you add a little bit of water and a little bit of, you know, you add a fridge for some food or whatever, and you're really tapping into that payload without doing any other modifications to the vehicle. So that's where you really want to consider the ground tent. So they're, they are super light. What was the lightest tent you had in the test or approximately the weight on that? The lightest one in our tent was approximately, I think, three and a half pounds. Yeah. Um, so super light. Yeah. And we, we'll talk about it later, but tents get lighter than that too. Yeah. One of the advantages is that then you can use that tent for other things. You can use it on your motorcycle or whatever. So I really like the fact that round tents are much lighter weight than you would see with a typical roof tent configuration. Now there are some very heavy ground tents, especially ones that are canvas in sure. nature. If you need less payload, if you need a lighter payload, go with one of those lightweight ground tents. And I think, you know, weight transitions nicely into kind of my last thing, which is overall size, which we talked about, right? I picked the tents for this test specifically because they fit inside a vehicle. And so ground tents aren't just light. They take up very little uh, volume in a vehicle too. Let's kind of transition into cons of ground tents. Yeah, know? exactly. Um, because I think weight plays into the first one that I'll mention, which is durability. Yeah. Um, ground tents are directly on the ground on abrasive surfaces, and they're usually fairly lightweight nylon material. Mm -hmm. um, and so long-term use, um, will wear them out eventually versus a rooftop tent. Again, as the example, it's never touching the ground. It's up on top of your vehicle. They usually have dedicated covers to protect them from ultraviolet light, which can wear out the material. So it is a consideration. Yeah. I had recently, I, I did a trip with a SUV we were testing and I use ground tents a lot because I'm oftentimes camping and testing a vehicle that we don't do modifications to. So I use ground tents a lot and I had this really nice three person MSR tent and we were up on the Mogollon rim, wind kicks up, lifts the tent up. You know, it was staked down, but it pulled the, some of the stakes out and it went right into a tree and it put a giant hole in the fly. Mm -hmm. um, so you're right. They are not as durable oftentimes as the heavier canvas style ones. What other things can you think of that are maybe not as ideal for ground tents? You know, when you do have an issue with the tents, they're difficult to repair in the field. Mm -hmm. So the holes tend to be fairly lightweight. They can bend, get damaged, and they're more difficult to repair. It's good to keep that in mind. You're, you're doing car camping, so you can bring some things along. So one of the things that I always bring along with me is a repair sleeve. And a lot of times they'll have uh, little set screws on the end so that it keeps it in place. So you, if you do bend a pole, you can slide the repair sleeve over the top of the bend and then reinforce the pole for use inside the tent, for use with the tent. Definitely the material. So making sure that you've got patch kits and ways to, to reinforce the material if you do get a failure in the field. Uh, that's another thing too. And then just being really mindful of the fact that they're delicate. You got to just kind of change. I mean, I felt, you know, I, I recognized that I didn't set the tent up properly. An unexpected gust came up and I paid the price of not fully staking the tent out. It wasn't the tent's fault. I only put in four stakes. It was kind of loose, loamy material or of ground cover. And so it just ripped the small stakes out and, and I damaged the tent. So I think really being mindful of the fact that the tents are a little more fragile. Yeah. I, I like how you mentioned having a like a repair kit, you know, because yeah. they usually don't take up a lot of space. So it's, don't. you've, you've kind of got to have that as a backup. One other thing that comes to mind for me um, that can be a little bit more challenging with ground tents also is uh, the complexity of the tents and the amount of time it can take to set them up. Sure. For this test, it was really fun. One thing I love to do is I, I love to try and use products without the instructions. And that might just be like a male thing. You, I don't know. You learn so much though. <laughs> I, I really, I really believe that, you know, like the best way to figure out good product design is can I figure this out? Now I have maybe a little bit more experience with setting up tents than probably the average person. I mean, I've spent like, I would venture 
I guess at thousands of nights under tents. So I've set up quite a few, but one thing I did with this test was I attempted to set up all the tents without instructions. <laughs> and there were a couple that took me, no joking, 45 minutes to an hour to set up so interesting without instructions. Yeah. So imagine being in weather and just feeling so frustrated that you can't make your shelter. Absolutely. So, I mean, one thing I would mention along with that is it's always a good idea to set up your ground tent ahead of time mm-hmm. at home when you don't have the pressure of bad weather or an emergency situation, you know, like test it before you take it out into the field and assume you'll be able to do it. And if your partner's coming along with you, set it up with them yes. before you go out in the field. Yes. So you because that can, be, that can put, that can put the relationship under some pressure. If the wind's blowing and the, and the rain's coming and yep. you're trying to help each other set it up. So by doing it ahead of time, uh, you can improve the outcomes of your trip. For yeah. Sure. But I mean, you know, you compare that to, let's say a, a rooftop tent that is a wedge design. I yeah. mean, those, they set up in five or 10 seconds. It's incredible. Super fast. Some, some don't, the ones that open sideways and yep. have the tension rods that you have to insert and ladders and all this stuff, you know, they can take longer, but I think some rooftop tents have that advantage. They really do. But they're also, and you can leave your bedding, your pillows, everything all inside them so they can be much faster. So yeah, you're not usually gaining a lot of speed with a ground tent. Yeah. I there are some exceptions, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but the other con I find, and I have found with ground tents is you don't always have control over where you've got a camp. There's sections of many trails that are packed with lava and lava rocks. And let's say it's getting dark and you need to find a place to camp. You can't always find level ground and you can't always find a place that you can stake out a tent either. So if you don't have access to rocks and guidelines and stuff like that, to be able to to stake out a tent using some weight, then it can be a complication trying to get those things set up. Also imagine the rain has come in. It's now a totally muddy trail and you're having to set up your tent in the mud. Of course they work, but then you spend a lot of time when you get back getting them cleaned up. You know, it's really important when we have these expensive nylon tents that we never leave them wet in the bag for even a minute longer than you have to. Um, As soon as you get a chance to be able to take the tent out and get it dried out, the better. We have definitely lost some tents within our own team because someone forgot and the tent went back wet. Next time you pull it out, it all delaminates. The tent's destroyed. So making sure that you get them dried out as quickly as possible. That's such an important thing to keep in mind. I have a friend who's like, he's always kind of reinforced this idea of being a good owner of products. Mm. You know, there's no point in investing in expensive items if you're not going to take care of them properly. And and what you just said is so crucial. I mean, you know, you can buy the $1,500 canvas tent and if you leave it wet in its bag overnight, it can be a moldy, disgusting mess the next day. So totally. You have to kind of commit to that when you invest in one of these things. Yeah. Or even sand and stuff. We did a mm-hmm. trip across the Altar Desert and it just, the tents were three season tents and they were packed with sand. Oh man. It took a while to get them cleaned out properly when we get back or else the next time you go camping, there's sand all inside your tent and that's never fun. I mean, it's amazing how you can feel those just a couple grounds of sand. You can feel it in your sleeping bag. So I love those lightweight backpacking tents that are freestanding where when you're done, you can literally pick it up over your head yeah, and shake super it helpful. That, that's, you know. It's super helpful. Yeah, Yeah. totally. And uh, I would agree. There are many advantages to ground tents and that's why we wanted to cover them in detail for a podcast. Let's start going through some of the units that you tested. We're going to talk about 10 tents over the next minutes. um, And most of them were tested by Matt in the Overland Journal article, but then we're also going to include some additional tents um, and some tents that didn't fall within the original criteria of being in a bag in the back of a compact SUV. So we'll talk through those two. So let's start off with that Nemo wagon top. Was it wagon top? Is that what it's called? Yeah. Yeah. So the first one, yeah, it was the Nemo wagon top. It was the wagon top four. So it's offered in, I believe a four, a six and an eight. And that refers to the capacity can sleep four, six or eight people. I like this tent. This is kind of uh, what I would describe as a more conventional, you know, family style tent. It was the four person model. So it had room for up to four adults, which would be great for a small family, you know, mom and dad and a couple kids or, you know, two people and their dog would be a lot of space for two people and a dog and a dog really comfortable. Um, it had a really nice big vestibule on one end that was removable. So you've got some great space that's not in the tent, but that has some weather protection for storing gear. That's something I always appreciate in a tent as a vestibule, just, just to have more livable space without your stuff packed in around you. Sure. The Nemo had some cool little innovative designs. One of those things was the design of the window covers. They were elastic with just a little, a little hook. What you would do is you would pull the window cover down and 
hook it from the bottom. So there was no zipper to mess with, with mm. for opening or closing the windows for ventilation. I thought that was just a really innovative design that I'm surprised I haven't seen that any other ground tents before. But obviously... How about stand-up height? Was it good for stand-up height? It was great, yeah. Um, now, I'm like 5'7". I'm not... I'm a below average height individual, so it was plenty of space for me. But I think even if you were... I believe it was like up to six foot tall wow. would be able to stand in there. And I put the specifications in the, the journal article so people can sure. look more in detail about that. But this the, the wagon top also had nice vertical walls. So almost the majority of the interior space was usable standing space uh, because the walls were not slanted inwards. So. Yeah, that makes a big difference. Overall, Nemo just makes really innovative products. I've used their tents for a very long time. And of course, in full disclosure, they've never been an advertiser, but one of the principals of Nemo, Cam Brinzinger, has been a longtime personal friend. So he would send me these things and say, hey, test this out and tell me how it goes and what, what works and what doesn't work. They made a an inflatable pole tent for many years, and it just became my go-to off of the motorcycle because you didn't have any long poles to deal with or even a pole bag to deal with. You could just shove it into a, a pannier. And I don't think they make any of the of the inflatable pole tents anymore. Maybe some of their compact, kind of like a bivy tent. Mm-hmm. I think some of those, they still have the air pole in them. And those are awesome. I'm really a fan of the air pole design from Nemo. That's cool. Yeah. I've never used one myself, but I, I remember when they launched those a while back and it was just so cool. You know, it's so different. Yeah. They had this one that was called a Morpho 1P. It was the literally the perfect solo motorcycle tent. You could sit upright in it. Mm-hmm. It was like a bivy tent that had, you know, because of the air being designed, you could just sit up in the center of it. And I remember going like searching eBay and my, like, I bought like several of them because I just, I knew that, you know, they wear out and I wanted to always have one. So yep. it's funny what you latch on to. Nice. Okay. Well, that's the wagon top. And you yeah, know, that sounds like a great one. Good for solid a family. choice. And, and kind of the final, final tidbit on that one is it's just, it was a little bit more affordable. I think it was like somewhere around the $500 price point. So sure. under a thousand dollars, which some people may kind of scoff at that number for a tent, a four plus person tent that's going to hold up to years of use. That's kind of par for the course. Yeah, really so, fair. Yeah, I think so. Well, in a similar tent to that one, but a different design is called the Gazelle. And the Gazelle uses these hubs. They have poles that come into a center hub. Um, you actually push up the hub in the very middle of, so it's a long tent. So that's the challenge with it. And that's why it wasn't in that test was that it's, um, you know, probably five or six feet long. Almost looks like an awning when it's packed. Correct. Sure. It does like a bag awning. Yep. Um, so if you've got a pickup truck bed or you've got a longer SUV or a roof rack, you could strap it to, it works great for that. I think it's about five feet long. It's it's very easy to set up though. You just kind of pull it out of the bag. You get the process kind of started of it unfolding. And then you step inside one of the doors and you push up in the hub that goes in the center of it up high. And then that at least gets that part set up. And then the four corners, you pull the hubs out and it creates this uh, very sturdy structure with, like you said, on the wagon top with an enormous amount of space on the inside because all of the walls are being pushed out. So it's full stand up height and very vertical walls. If it's light wind, you don't really need to stake it down much other than just a couple corners. Uh, but if the wind picks up, you definitely want to stake out those hubs because otherwise they can collapse in on you. It's pretty it's pretty uh, disturbing in the middle of the night when the, the tent like folds you up like an origami. They're nice quality. They're they're fairly affordable. Um, I think it's great for car camping. It's a good car camping choice. And that one, the, the poles are already integrated, right? You Correct. don't have to like fish them through sleeves and figure out where they go. They're already, it comes ready to set up. You just take off the cover and, and everything's all already integrated into the tent fabric and sewn into the tent fabric. And it's very easy to set it up. Got it. And Ryan Keegan, uh, our cinematographer that works here, he's been using the same unit that we tested for years now with good success. It's never failed him. So, and I think he even, you know, spent a couple months in Southern Utah living out of the thing. So it's proven to be pretty durable. How is it setting up uh, as an individual? Is it doable or super easy? That's nice. It's extremely easy. I think, I think the tent takes less than a minute. Okay. I mean, it's just very fast. I mean, if you exclude doing the additional guy lines, it's very fast. It's clever. Sounds nice. Okay. Well, the next one that was part of our test that I was really psyched on uh, is the Hilleberg Karen 3. So those are rad tents. They're incredible. I don't need to tell you, you've slept in quite a few of the Mm. different models from from them. Um, I assume on some of your polar trips, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. The Karen 3 is a tunnel design. So it it basically looks, it almost looks like a a greenhouse, you know, like a long tunnel greenhouse. And it has three poles. This is kind of interesting because before we were talking about four season tents and, and how the more 
crisscrosses of poles that you have, the more strength you have. But this is one of those tent designs that kind of goes the opposite way of that theory, but still is incredibly strong. It uses three poles and none of them cross, but just because of the way that they form these hoops and with the way that you guide the tent out and stake it out, it's like, I mean, it can hold up to like hurricane force winds. Incredibly strong. Yeah. Luckily I didn't have to deal with any wind that strong, but I did, I tested this one actually quite a while before some of the other tents and I had it out on the Western slope in Utah in some pretty windy desert environments. And it's like, it's rock solid. They're like, bomber. Barely moves. This one's really cool. It's a, it's like a double wall design. So you've got the outer fly material and then there's like an inner mesh kind of cocoon with a waterproof bathtub style floor. The two are connected. So you don't have to set up the inner tent and then put the fly on. You just push oh, the poles it. through and it kind of springs into place and it's all set up. You can remove the inner tent and it saves you a whole bunch of weight. So you can camp with just the outer waterproof fly and use it as a floorless tent. Interesting. And it saves you like half the weight of the tent. And it's a pretty lightweight tent to begin with, considering the size and the fact that it is a four season tent. And how durable it is. It's yeah. so durable. Yeah. And and I mean, kind of the one other thing that I would mention about Hilberg is, you know, their tents are premium tents. Tents. They cost, I think this was like a $1,200 tent, maybe mm-hmm. a little bit more. And some of their tents are, are more than that. The quality of craftsmanship in this is really second to none. I mean, again, I said, you know, at the beginning of this podcast, I've slept in a lot of tents on a lot of occasions. This is hands down one of the nicest tents I've ever been in. And you see wow, it. that says a lot. You see it in every detail of the tent. Everything has thought and design put into it, like from the vents to the toggles to the mm-hmm. zippers. I mean, it is just, you can tell that this has been refined over a long period of time and it's just, it's so good. <laughs> like, yeah. I loved using this tent and despite the fact that you can't stand up in it, I think it has its place for people that are going to more extreme environments where, you know, you have to have absolute weatherproofness in, like I said, hurricane force winds, snow, rain in, in something that's just going to last for a long time. If yeah. You- imagine if someone is doing a, a multi-year year trip, they want to be able to have a tent that will not only survive that length of time, but then work in just about any condition. Yeah. Yeah. That's impressive. If you were in a hot environment in the desert, then you could just run only the shell, you know, maybe sleep on a, on a ground tarp or something. Yep. underneath. And this one also, despite being super burly and, and durable, um, it, it wasn't that heavy. Uh, I want to say it was under 10 pounds. So yeah, that's and, impressive. And, and it can sleep three is the idea. Yeah, that's impressive. Those are very cool tents. I've always been a huge fan. Like you just kind of, you just know you've got something special when you, when you own one of those. Yeah. It's kind of, I, f- I know a lot of people who are like, outdoor gear aficionados. And it's like, that's like the pinnacle of tent ownership. You totally, <laughs> you totally them. geek out on yeah, that for totally. sure. All right. Well then the next one we'll talk about, which is another stand up, definitely more car camping tent is the Oz tent. Uh, they have a couple different sizes. Uh, they end up very long. So you typically have to have them in a full size truck bed, or you need to have them up on a rack. You know, they can be six and a half, seven, eight feet long. They're very easy to set up, basically remove the tent from the storage bag, which is is a super heavy duty canvas. And then the tent itself is like a reinforced nylon canvas material. You pull out two arms. Uh, you have to do it in the right order so you don't it doesn't break any of the hinges. That's one of the challenges with that tent is if you don't set it up properly, you can you can bend the aluminum structure or break one of the plastic hinges. But once you know how it works, there's one arm that comes out and then the other arm comes out and then you step inside the tent with the door open and you just lift it up all in as one unit and it sets up. There's two tensioning hinges on the inside. And once you pop those into place, the tent all develops you know a strong structure, but it does need to be like heavily guyed out during any kind of wind because it's like a giant sail. So you have to really be careful about making sure that every Every possible guy line is implemented uh, because we've seen a couple of them kind of fold in on themselves in wind without without proper uh, staking and guy lines. They use these plastic hinges, which are basically like a fusible link. So you don't destroy the aluminum structure. Typically one of the plastic hinges will fail. So it's a good idea to bring some of those along as spares and so they you sell can, them. You can they replace them. them in the field. You can, yeah. You can even field service them. Typically requires a drill bit. Um, so you can drill out where they've pinched the aluminum pole around the hinge. You drill that out. You can slide out the plastic hinge, slide it in another one, and then 
then you end up using like a bolt once it's been repaired. But it is very easy to repair um, if you got the right tools. But they're super roomy, kind of a heavy canvas. So they're definitely would last for decades. Uh, and then they've got a clever awning that kind of, so once you get it set up, you end up with this, this uh, totally uh, a vertical entry door and with a bunch of windows, but then you can unroll this awning that has additional poles. And then if you wanted to, like if you had, you wanted more space, you could actually put walls on that. So you could end up with a sitting area if you were in a buggy, buggy spot. I was going to say, could you, I feel like I've seen people even set these up against the side of their truck. So you can almost walk from the tent and open like your vehicle door. You could. With, totally. with almost complete weather protection. A hundred percent. Yeah. And, and that would actually be a really clever way to do it would be put the awning up to the rack would be really clever. You'd end up, you know, you'd end up with a, a breezeway to sit in yep. next to your vehicle. And they're very popular. The only thing to consider is that they're heavy and that they typically require a rack because they're very long. This content is brought to you by Overland Journal, our premium quality print publication. The magazine was founded in 2006 with the goal of providing independent equipment and vehicle reviews, along with the most stunning adventures and photography. We care deeply about the countries and cultures we visit and share our experiences freely with our readers. We also have zero advertorial policy and do not accept any advertiser compensation for our reviews. By subscribing to Overland Journal, you're helping to support our employee-owned and veteran-owned publication. Your support also provides resources and funding for content like you are watching or listening to right now. You can subscribe directly on our website at overlandjournal.com. Similar but different, the spring bar. Yeah, tent. classic. Yeah, a super classic. They're really cool. They're made in Utah by hand. They're incredibly robust. Uh, so this was the only cotton canvas tent that I tested, but I, I wanted to test kind of a more traditional tent and totally spring bar has been around for a while and they have figured things out as far as like construction methods that work. And, you know, it's funny, like I don't think of cotton canvas as a material that I would use generally for outdoor activities, but it is very weather resistant. Although I might suggest not using this if you're going to be in a perpetually wet environment. You know, mm -hmm. this comes back to that specialization thing. Like there's a place for specific tents, but yeah, the spring bar is really cool. Um, it is a big, heavy tent. I think it weighed close to maybe 60 or 60 pounds or so, yeah. um, with everything, holes, sure. tent, maybe even a little bit more. Um, but it's, yeah, it's this like heavy duck canvas. It's got like a TPU floor that feels like, you know, really bomber. It's so bomber. It's like you put it down and and you can feel like little rocks and stuff under it on the ground, but you're like, you're not at all worried about puncturing it. Sure. It's got nice vertical walls on all four sides. It's, it's like a rectangular floor plan. So it's, you know, fairly traditional in that way. Plenty of standing room. Um, I had no problem being inside. And I think, you know, someone up to six foot, maybe even could fit in there. Particularly with how like the roof line arches, yep. which is, I think, something unique to the spring bar. The pole layout is very unique too. It's not your traditional like sleeves or integrated poles. You, I mean, that's where the name comes from, spring bar. So you put these these two separate poles into the roof that kind of form the ridge line of the they roof. fiberglass so that the, they can flex? They're actually... They are metal, um, okay, got it. but they're almost like the tension rods that you would use in a rooftop tent to kind of hold out the fly. You insert them into these T brackets and they, those are flexible. And so you have the two center poles kind of come together and meet in the middle and then you almost like press them down and there's a lot of resistance. And then there's a sleeve that comes over that once they're pressed into place and the sleeve is over it, it puts a lot of tension on that roof and it creates, yeah, like this roof line that kind of channels water sure. off of it and it presents enough tension to give it a lot of structure. Yeah, it's such a clever design and it's and it's just held up to the test of time. I mean, people have been using these things for decades. Yeah, yeah so it's this, a very cool tent. This was their traveler model. Um, nice. And so in addition to that square floor plan with the standing room, it's got these big floor to ceiling windows that you can open that have mesh in them to keep bugs out. It's got, I mean, it's so charming looking. It kind of for sure. reminds me of like the kind of British campaign no furniture, doubt. Like, yeah. it, but it's, it's beautiful to look at. And it's also got this great awning that comes out. So you get that kind of porch shaded area outside and it comes with like these super burly stakes that you can just like hammer into the ground with a, you know, a 
mini sledgehammer. And, yeah, sure. I mean, this was a very solid tent. Um, About how long did it take to set up? Do you remember? Was it one of the easier ones to set up? Or Once I did have to watch a YouTube video to see how the roof pole was assembled because I've never assembled something sure. like that. So I was like looking at it, not even understanding how it came together. But I mean, I immediately understood it once I watched this video and total setup was like under 40 minutes for me solo. Okay. And I was able to set it up solo despite it being like a heavy early tent. Sure. Um, and it held up great in wind. You know, we had some really windy days out by the superstitions where I had that one testing like in 30 mile an hour winds and nothing broke. I mean, it had these, it has these really great loops, you know, the loops that you normally stake a tent out with mm-hmm. on this, they're steel. Wow. Wow. Yeah. It's like, I have no doubt that, you know, this is another one of those tents where if you take care of it, it's going to last, like it could last a lifetime. Literally. For sure. Yeah. It's something you'd give to your kids or something like that. Totally. And it's timeless, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's like, it, I imagine the tent from 40 years ago is like, you almost can distinguish it from the modern ones. Yeah. So cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I really like about that one. And you know, it's made in the USA and they're passionate outdoor people and yeah, they've definitely been popular in the community. All right. Well, the next one we're going to talk about, which is kind of a true hybrid tent and it's new to the market and it is the, the C6 outdoors tent. So they call it their rev tent and it is very much designed to be able to work on a roof rack as a roof tent. It can actually be used as a roof tent with their platform just on crossbars. So you can buy a platform. It weighs about 40 pounds. It actually folds open like a regular roof tent, has a ladder, self-supporting. You can use it on a bare roof rack. If there's enough slats, like on a front runner rack, if you can add additional slats, so you have enough coverage, Um, you can also use it as a ground tent. And then you can also use it in the bed of a truck as a bed tent as well. And it looks kind of like a roof tent when it's opened up, but it has a four inch thick mattress on the inside and the tent itself weighs only 25 pounds. The one thing that I notice is it is a little bit big. It's probably 48 inches square. So you got to have some space for that, but it's not overly large where you couldn't put it in a standard SUV or just strap it to your roof rack. So that's pretty clever. And I've even seen people not use a rack at all. So if you have a strong enough roof or like, for example, a Jeep Wrangler roof, which is actually quite strong, um, not in a dynamic setting, but in a static load setting, you actually use these little inserts that you close the doors on it and it it locks the tent in place on the roof. And then you can sleep just right on a bare roof um, with the tent itself. So it's, and it's got a kind of a quilted cover on the mattress, you know, thoughtful colors. It's just, it's a style stylish tent mm-hmm. and it's only 800 bucks, which for a tent that does all of those things yeah. pretty well, including having a mattress, I've used the mattress more than I've used the tent. You just pull the mattress out and like get people stay in at the house or just an additional, I even used it on the sailboat, like as an additional mattress to be able to, <laughs> to sleep extra people. So it's really easy just to pull the mattress out and use it for other purposes as well. So what I like about it, it's kind of like the Jack of all trades tent, uh, but it does quite a few of them. Well, that versatility is awesome. Like yeah. having a, a tent like that, that can do so many things in yep. so many different ways is cool. You know, that was the C6, you said C6 outdoors. Yeah. Um, okay. So the next one I wanted to talk about was the seek outside yeah. red cliff. I think this was one of the more interesting tents in the mix personally, mostly because it was the first hot tent that I've tested. So this has a, an optional, uh, titanium wood stove that can, oh, be, wow. can be integrated. Yeah. Which is really unique. I've, I'd never used, uh, any kind of a heater in a tent before. You get cold enough to be able to, you know, it in the desert, it cools off. So despite the fact that I was testing this in the spring outside of Phoenix, sure. um, there were some nights where it got down into the thirties. So I was totally able to, to get in there, light the stove and, and, and you actually have it with you here somewhere, don't they? I do. We've yeah. got, so for those of you who are, who are watching this, the video version, or if I should say, if you're listening to the podcast, this is a great reason to go check out the podcast on YouTube because yep. we have video. So you can see some of these things that we're talking about. That's but, right. Impressed by the weight. It was, it feels like it weighs yes. just a couple pounds. If that, so this, what we're looking at here, we've got a front runner Wolfpack box and I've got the entire thing in the box and, and that's the titanium wood stove and the six person tent. I think the full, the full up weight of this is like around maybe 10 pounds for the whole thing. That's incredible. That's that's six, totally incredible. Tent. They achieve that because it's a sill nylon tent. So it's a single wall tent. It's floorless. So you're, you're saving a lot of weight there. There are obviously some trade-offs to that. It's got great tensile strength. It does well in the wind, but abrasion resistance is going to be a bit lower because okay. sill nylon is lightweight. So uh, this is one that you kind of want to take care of. Setup is a little bit more time consuming because it's a TP design. So you kind of have to like stake out certain points 
first. Oh, um, got it. And you have to be conscientious of putting in the single pole in the center because if you stake the points out too far apart, then the pole won't be able to fully extend that. So basically what I'm saying is this was one of the most complex tents to set up in the whole mix. And this one took me well over an hour to set it up the first time. But part of that was also because setting up the wood stove is kind of a lengthy process. And I had never tested this beforehand. So I didn't subscribe to my, you know, advice of testing this before you take it out. (laughs) Sure. sure. Oh, you're testing. Right. We're testing. So, so this is a titanium wood stove in this little stuff sack. I mean, it looks like a small messenger bag for those that are listening. It's super small. It's not big. And this is, there's like an eight foot stovepipe in here that's titanium that you roll out and put these little steel cables around to keep the shape. You assemble this box that has these legs to keep it elevated off the ground. It has like a flue, like a traditional stove. It's got a little door with a damper so you can really dial in the burning of the wood. It's not like this precisely machined wood stove like maybe you would have in like a traditional home. So dialing it in to burn properly is like it takes some practice, but does it have some surface area where you could put like some water to totally. heat up? And, and, and I, I did, I made coffee on top of it. Amazing. So the ability to heat your tent and also prepare some breakfast inside. I mean, it's so novel and the whole thing is sealed. So you don't really have to worry about smoke or fumes. It's vented outside. And it's, it's really interesting the way that they created this, this vent for the, the, chimney because obviously that gets hot because you've got, you know, burning sure gases from wood going out. There's like a silicone coated fireproof material that's sewn in, in a square with a little mm. Velcro flap. So you, you lift the Velcro flap on the outside, you push the stovepipe through. And I mean, I had <laughs> the first time I use it, I had flames coming out the top of the eight inch chimney because I hadn't figured out the flue properly <laughs> and it didn't do any damage to the wow. tent material. I mean, I was amazed. Yeah. That's, inc- is it like a Nomex? Yeah, it might be Interesting. Yeah, like a Nomex or certainly on their website. I'm sure it elaborates. Super cool. It's so cool. And I think we're Did actually- Did it get toasty in there? It gets so warm. It gets so <laughs> warm so fast. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. it's incredible. I would love to to take this out in like a true winter environment. My friend who lives in Colorado, who's an elk hunter, turned me on to this company because they're another, you know, made in the USA company. They're based in Grand Junction, Colorado. They make all their tents by hand there. It's small, incredible. Small team of people. Yeah, it's really cool. And so he uses one of these for elk hunting. So he'll go out, he'll set up his base camp with this. He'll go out and he'll scout and he'll come back and have a wood fire and warm up. And then he'll go back out and he'll set it up for like a week. And that's his base camp. Yeah, yeah. that's incredible. I mean, it would seems like it would be ideal for people who like to use, they overland into a destination that they want to explore further on foot or with a mountain bike or whatever. They're just going to kind of leave this tent set up in any weather. I think that's a great insight. I, this is not a tent. If you're someone who likes to move around every night, this is not really the tent for you. Mm. Because because even with a small group, I mean, it's it's a process to, to set it up. Sure. I should say for me, I wouldn't want to use this if I were moving every night. But for yeah. base camping, super cool. And yeah, it's got a lot of space. It's a six person tent. So you can pack people in there. And, and then it all fits in a wolf box. It's amazing. Yeah. That and I mean, so cool. even, you know, I should mention, you don't have to use it with the the titanium wood stove. And if you ditch that, it's even smaller. I mean, it's like, a, I think it's a like a six pound tent without the titanium wood stove for six people. So, wow. So it's kind of for the people that are doing like fat tire hunting in that where you're literally just needing the, a super light tent yeah. to go back in and base camp for a while. And That's, I think they do kind of market to the hunting crowd more, sure. more so than any other user. Totally works for overland travel too. So No doubt. Yeah. Oh, that's very cool. All right. So then the next group of tents we have to talk about is they call them like a 10 second tent or a three second tent. It just depends on how it's marketed. Uh, front runner sells one. They're basically like the window shade that you put up in your car where it kind of springs open, except it's bigger and, and it's probably three feet in diameter in a heavy duty sleeve. And if you are somebody who doesn't want to spend a lot of time setting up a tent, they are extremely fast to set up. I mean, you you basically pull it out of the sleeve and you just throw it up in the air and it just pops open, totally set up and lands on the ground. And then you stake it out if you need to, if there's some wind, but it's self-supported. So you don't have to stake it out. You can just throw your sleeping bag and some gear in the inside. As long as it's like weighted down. Correct. Yeah, Yeah, correct. But um, if there's any wind, you definitely want to stake them out, but uh, they are so easy to set up. They take up a little bit of space. Again, it's like a, a three foot diameter 
kilometers. So I've been able to just tuck them along the roll bar of a, of a Wrangler. Um, they're very easy to store inside the vehicle, even though there are they are a little bit big in diameter. They're not very thick. Also, uh, not terribly expensive. Uh, the downside to those is that, and this has been true for any of the manufacturers that I've tested, they're made from fiberglass so that it, they have some spring to them and they do tend to break. Like if you, if you aren't careful with how you put them away or you're not mindful of that, I've even seen some of the joints uh, the glue fail and then the and then the fiberglass pole pops out and so I've had some cracked poles and some disassembled poles and and other issues with those uh, I think they do get better and better with time uh, but they are definitely worth considering a super fast setup I'll say like on the on the instruction thing when you go, when you go to put this thing away for the first time probably a good idea to know how to do it because the colorful words I've heard from people trying to put these things away <laughs> like it is a very specific process of like and basically you stick it up against the tire of the vehicle to help support the other side Mm -hmm. so it doesn't start flipping in the air and flipping every different direction. Make sure you have your phone out if somebody's trying to put one of those away for the first time because it's going to be humorous. But once you get it, it's like, oh, now you're kind of like folding up a taco and turning it into a circle somehow. Makes me think of like those light reflectors. You kind of have to like twist it. Exactly. That's exactly how it goes. But it's also this big tent. You got to have some planning. Just watch somebody struggle and... and (laughs) And, and enjoy. Some, and just, have, just enjoy. Beverage. Yeah, exactly. Those are definitely worth considering super fast setup. And now the Big Agnes. Yeah, Big Agnes. So Big Agnes is, this is another Colorado company. Lots of tent makers there. Uh, they're based out of Steamboat Springs, Colorado, actually, and have been for quite a while. So we tested the their Mint Saloon, which is yeah. really, it's a really interesting different tent, which is why I threw it in the mix. It's like, they describe it as like a yurt style tent. Oh, cool. Um, it's, it's a floorless, single wall tent. It uses two poles, but it's got kind of like a a TP style single center pole. Cool. And then a really like a literally like a 35 foot pole, like skinny pole that that comes in from the side and kind of creates a round lip around yeah. the outside. So that you get a semi-vertical yeah, wall. Yeah, exactly. Like the first, I want to say two and a half to three feet of wall is vertical. Wow. And then it kind of comes in like a teepee overhead. That's clever. Or a yurt. Yeah, it, it is clever. It's huge inside. Um, it has room for like eight people. Wow. Uh, yeah, it's floorless. I believe you can get a footprint or a floor that you can use with it. I thought that like a really good use case would be like you're going out with a group of your buddies on an overland route. Maybe you have rooftop tents or maybe you have individual sleeping tents, but you could set this up as like an indoor mess hall for everyone to kind of convene. Like a gathering place. Totally. Yeah. Because it's just got so much interior space. Like you could literally set up an indoor camp kitchen for, you could have like four people cooking on multiple tables. I mean, it had a lot of standing room and a lot of usable space. And so that was kind of ideal. Or maybe if you're going out with a group and you're doing an overland route and you all have kids and you want to put the kids all together in one tent, this could be a fun way to kind of like put them all together. They have plenty of space. They can all be with their buddies and then maybe you can have some peace and quiet. Oh, what a cool idea for those that want to cook inside a tent. It's really important to make sure that you have a fire blanket. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't consider doing any cooking inside a tent without it. Uh, they have them in different sizes. The The bigger ones are important for if you're group cooking. The crazy story, we were in the middle of the Greenland ice sheet. We have one tent that we can use for cooking and for gathering the team, a heavy duty insulated wall tent called an Arctic oven. Breakfast was being prepared and it was the traditional Coleman multi-fuel stove. We were using white gas. Uh, somebody was in there cooking. Next thing you know, you hear screaming, you hear fire. The person runs out of the tent. I knew that there was a fire blanket in there and I just happened to have been a fireman. So firemen are never very bright. So that we're the ones that run into the fire. I ran into the tent, grabbed the fire blanket and we were able to snuff it out. But these tents can and catch fire very quickly. They are fire retardant. They're designed to do that. They, there's regulations around tents being fire retardant. Uh, but what it basically means is that they can still burn through instantly, yep. but it, they don't catch on fire. So like the tent doesn't continue to burn until it's all the way down to the ground. Anywhere flame touches or even gets close, it'll just burn a hole through it. So for us being in minus 40 conditions, this was critical to get the fire out as quickly as possible. So anybody who's cooking inside of a tent, make sure you got a fire blanket. We learned that one the hard way. That's so. that's very good advice. And, and I will mention, so the 
the mint saloon has this really big entryway that I did have to duck to get under it, but it's big enough that two people can pass each other coming in and out. Wow. And then it's got some um, side windows that are kind of at like waist height that open downwards, if I remember correctly. Oh, and then clever. it's got a roof vent as well. So it's got a decent amount of ventilation. So with it all the way opened up, you know, I think, um, and, and with some caution, yeah. I think what a could. cool tent. What a cool tent. And yeah. again, for those that are listening, Paula, our producer will be dropping in uh, either footage or still images of each one of these tents so you can see what they look like as well. Yeah, I have some cool, I actually got some drone footage of everything but the Hilleberg because I tested that one like a year ago. Hopefully there'll be some good video footage so you can kind of cool. see the shape and what it looks like. And I even, I used a LiDAR on my iPhone 13 to do interior VR scans. And I'm going to try and figure out a way to, to put those up on Expedition Portal when we bring some of this information over there. So you might be actually able to do a little 3D tour of the inside of these tents. Oh, that's awesome. Like. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Try that out. All right. Well, and you've got our last tent, number 10. Yeah. The last, the last one is the classic REI Half Dome 2 Plus. This is like your traditional two-person backpacking tent. No standing room, lightweight, under four pounds, quick to set up. It's a three-season tent, so it's pretty sturdy in wind. So uh, um, my partner, Amanda, and I have one of these. It's actually hers. Uh, she got it on like a screaming deal at one of the REI garage sales because nice. the previous owner had the elastic failed in one of the poles, which was actually a kind of a common thing I read about these is that that happens, but it did didn't render the tent unusable. It just means you have to kind of like hold one of the poles together before putting it into the sleeve. Sure. So it's still completely usable. This tent's great. We've taken it a lot of places backpacking. We have used it for car camping on tons of occasions. The one that we tested was actually, it's it's like slightly older version of this tent because REI has been just evolving this one um, and it's still around. So they have they have it now. And the current one has a few design tweaks. It will be slightly different than the one that we tested for this. Overall, it's it's a similar design. And we're able to fit the two of us plus our dog inside. And it's got vestibules on both sides. So you can store like a backpack nice. plus boots outside of the main tent body, but within a weather protected area. Um, and I, it's just it's just a super simple, affordable tent. Uh, it could be a great first tent if you're not looking to go and spend five hundred dollars. And I think these retail for like somewhere between two and three hundred dollars. So um, and we've had very fair. Yeah, we've had this one for I want to say like eight years or something. <laughs> That's awesome. And it's got a couple patches on it. Sure. It's still going strong. Yeah. What a great tent. Yeah. REI definitely has made some really nice private labeled tents for sure. Yeah. White labeled tents. Yeah. yeah. They have, and, and they have so many different designs too. You know, you can get standing room tents from them. They, they used to have that lifetime warranty. They don't quite do that anymore, but I think they have a pretty solid, you know, year warranty on anything. So you can, you know, get something. And if it fails in the first year, they'll just replace it. No questions asked. So oh, that's impressive. And they're a national store. So there's some value there, you know, like let's say you're traveling for a trip and you, mm -hmm. you break something out on the road, being able to go to a branch in a different state and just bring it in and get a warranty replacement. That's actually pretty valuable. So yeah, I would agree. So that's, that's kind of it for the tents in the article. And plus the other ones that, that you've had some experience with. Well, what was your favorite? If you were to to pick one of these 10, which one would you grab? Oh man, I will say without hesitating, um, I'm going to take the Seek Out side tent on a backpacking trip uh, next month in Western Colorado. And I'm going to test it with four of us and the wood stove and see how it does. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. It's, it, you know, like I mentioned, it is one of the most complex ones to set up, but it was- If just, you got help, you got- Yeah. People yeah. We'll there. have four people so we can split that weight up when we are hiking with it. So, I mean, 10 pounds split between four people is like nothing to carry. Yeah. Potentially it could still be pretty cold at night there. So having that wood stove might be really nice. Yeah. I think that that one, it's cool. It's the versatility of that tent is hard to beat. And mm. I've used TP tents before um, that are floorless. And I just like that design. I mean, I'm, I'm totally fine with being on the Seems ground. Seems like people are really, people that love them, love them. And there's a couple different, really well-known manufacturers of those too. That there are. Like the Pahake and some others. Yeah. Yeah. I, actually, Jack, who's one of our other editors, um, he does a lot of bike touring. And mm. I know he has one from Hyperlight Mountain Gear, Yeah, um, like a DCF. TP that weighs like, I think it's like under four pounds. Wow. Um, and he reviewed it. I believe it's up on Expedition Portal, but he really liked that tent too. 
Yeah. For me off of the motorcycle, I tend to go with one of the really lightweight Nemo ones. They've got some that are, I'm a bigger guy. So even if it's a, like a single pole or like a, a Y pole design, um, it needs to have a little bit of interior space. So I like that. And then of course there's that classic Morpho one P, but you can't buy those anymore. I think I bought them all. <laughs> Everyone that was left, those are probably what I use most often off of the motorcycle. But the thing I've been grabbing just for general camping out of a vehicle is that new C6 Rev 10. I think it's, it's a very clear clever design to end up with a four inch thick mattress that can't get punctured. It's really clever. I can't tell you how many times I've had my lightweight camping yep. mattresses deflate on me on yep. a trip. And then you're like, you're just on the ground. Yeah. So it's a pretty good car camping tent in my opinion. Excellent. Yeah. That's awesome. cool. What else should we cover before we wrap things up? Well, I think that there's going to be a lot of different tent designs out there that people have used. If you've got a tent that you've got a great story, a bunch of miles with, or something that we didn't include in the tent, of course, there's we covered 10 tents and there's probably a hundred or more tents that would be suitable for overlanding. If there's one that comes to mind, please feel free to reach out to Matt or myself. Instagram's usually the best way to do that. Matt, how do people get a hold of you? M.B.Swartz on Instagram. And I would be Scott.A.Brady. If there's something that you've got a great story with, or you'd like to have us mention in a future episode of what really worked well for you, uh, please do that. Um, we love getting that kind of feedback so that we can consider that for future testing. Uh, we will have a, another ground tent test in the future for Overland Journal that'll cover a lot of those kind of larger units that are a little bit different design, uh, like the Oz tent and the Gazelle and others. Uh, so look for that in the future. Anything else that you'd like to add, Matt? That was a lot of material we just it covered. Was. I feel like let's let people digest that and yeah. you know see what kind of feedback they have. Yeah, I look forward to testing more of these in the future. And you know, it's it's really cool what's happening in the world of tent design. There's some really great innovation going on in fabrics. I kind of mentioned DCF, which is dynamic composite fabrics. I mean, their tents are getting much lighter and they're still very strong. I mean, you can get two person tents now that have floors and mosquito netting that are totally waterproof that weigh less than two pounds. Amazing. Um, you're going to pay a premium for them, but uh, the future of tents is pretty bright and exciting. Yeah. And, and using a ground tent for overlanding is super appropriate. It's been done far more than roof tents were ever done. People doing car camping with ground tents is very, very common. They can save you a lot of money. They can save you a lot of weight as well. So they're worth considering. Yeah, we appreciate you all listening and we will talk to you next time.